Hi, I'm Nick Beery, and welcome to another exciting edition of What Do You Do? If you're thirsty, we got a great show for you. We're going to Willowcroft Vineyards to find out how wine is made, as well as we're going to find out how Old Dominion Brewery makes their beer. So join us for this edition of What Do You Do? What do you do? What do you do? Do you sing in a band? What do you do? What do you do? I do things with your hands. What do you do? What do you do? You like to ride a bike? What do you do? What do you do? What is it that you like? Turn on the TV show. Uh, so sit down and relax, as here we go with the show. It's always asking you, what do you do? Beery, and welcome to another exciting edition of What Do You Do? Today we're in Ashburn, Virginia, where we're going to learn how beer is made. Now, over here serving me is the president of Old Dominion Brewery Company. His name is Jerry Bailey. Hi, Jerry. Hello, Nick. How are Thanks you? Thanks a lot. Welcome to the brewery. Now, this is a lager, isn't it? Yes, it is. Can you tell me a little bit about this lager? Well, it's a lager made in a very European tradition. We use only natural ingredients. We only use four ingredients, in fact. Malt, uh, water, yeast, and hops. Okay, I see you have some here. Can you show those to us? Sure. We, um, we use uh, a great deal of, of the two-row pale barley malt, which is what this is. And uh, when you taste it, um, it always reminds me of uh, grape nuts. Give Go it a try and see what you taste think. taste of that. Is that actually similar to what they make grape nuts out of? It certainly is. When you read the end of the, the grape nuts, uh, carton, it says that it's made out of malted barley, wheat, uh, yeast, and water. And it's just about as close as you can come to beer in a box. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to be 21, right? No, you don't. <laughs> what, uh, what are the other two? Well, we also use a, another kind of malt. Uh, it's called um, uh, caramel malt, 40 Love Bond. And it's malt that's made much the same way, except that instead of just being kiln dried, this is actually toasted. And so it's uh, the grain is a little bit caramelized and so when you bite it it's a little crunchier and chewier uh, this is what makes what gives beer its darker color because the other malt was fairly light color and you end up with a uh, pale beer if you only use pale malt but right. if, to the extent that you add darker malt the beer becomes darker obviously something like guinness has a lot of this kind of malt or even darker malt okay the other ingredients that I have are here to show you is we have um, hops which are come from, these are actually from Germany. These are called Hallertauer hops and um, we use them for uh, hops for two reasons in the brewing process. One of them is to add bitterness to the beer and the other one is to add aroma. Uh, these are aromatic hops. Yeah. What exactly is a hop? Is that how it grows out of the ground, or is that a process? To <laughs> Good question. Complete ignorance on this. I don't know. People just don't know where where hops come it from. It looks like something from a rabbit, but we'll get into that. <laughs> well, they are pelletized, but it's uh, not the way the rabbit does it. Okay. Um, actually, the scientific name for hops is cannabis lupulus, and that's a very close relative to another plant called cannabis. 
back there in the same family. Um, but this is hop, these hops uh, grow in the northwest of the United States and in Europe, and they grow on tall vines, and they're like on trellises. And actually what the hop is that we use is not the leaf, but rather the flower. And the flower, it looks a lot like, um, sort of like an acorn shaped, and a little bit like an artichoke with overlapping leaves. And so what the people who prepare these hops do is crush up the, the flower and then make pellets out of it. Can you explain to me how the beer lager that you make mm -hmm. is made? Well, we, we actually use a, a fairly complicated, complicated process called decoction. And decoction in German means that uh, you soak the grain in warm water. And what that does is in a way replicate what nature does in the springtime. Uh, when you take a piece of grain, when you have some grain, a seed, uh, in the spring it gets wet and warm, and then there are enzymes in the seed which convert those carbohydrates that are there into sugars. That's why the malt that we just tasted tastes sweet. Um, and we just continue, continue that process. Uh, it's a very straightforward, simple process, and in fact, brewers often say their main job is, is really just to prepare the table for the yeast, because it's the yeast that actually does the work in the brewery. So what we, the way we make that happen is that we, we uh, take about 1,200 pounds of malted barley for each 300 cases of beer that we make. And of course, brewers use different kind of categories and we do things in terms of barrels. And we, drew, we brew 25 barrels at a time. It's 50 kegs or 300 cases. We put the grain into the water and heat it up to various stages. And then after we've converted all of these uh, carbohydrates to sugars, we run water through the grain, through the lauder tongue, and that extracts the sugars. And uh, then we bring them back to the kettle, and I'll show you the kettle in a little while. Um, that uh, we cook the grain, or cook the, what we now call wort. And uh, it's a very, very serious boil. It's not this little delicate thing that you do with the soup at home. But uh, we actually uh, lose about 8% of the, the volume of the wort through evaporation. Uh, but we also get the pro some of the protein out of the wort, we sterilize it, and we add the hops during that boil, and we extract the hop oils, the lupulous oil, out of the hops, and that's what adds the bitterness and the, ar the aroma to the beer. And as soon as we finish the boil, we run it over to the whirlpool, which acts a li little bit like a centrifuge, and the centrifuge helps us get rid of the protein, some of the spent hops, and uh, then we cool the beer down very quickly, put it in a fermentation tank where we've got yeast in it. This is the smaller of the two fermenters we have, the 25 barrel fermenter. We generally have all 50 barrel fermenters. This holds about 730 gallons of wort. We ferment the wort here into beer. It's a high pressure vessel, It'll take about 20 pounds of pressure. It's glycol chilled. It's got two ports, one in the mid line here for pulling off the beer and one on the very bottom for pulling off yeast. We keep the beer in here for about a seven day fermentation process and it settles out the last three days coming to about ten days. We drop the temperature down to a logging, lagering of uh, 35 degrees and we'll hold it there until we're ready to use it, generally four weeks. At the end of the fermentation process and prior to packaging, we run the beer through here, um, if it's a, a beer without yeast on it. Uh, this is the filtration process. Basically, the, the beer with the yeast on it runs through this apparatus and through these, these cardboard-like filters. These, the beer comes in the bottom, is pushed up through these pads, and is stripped out with these. It goes out the other end and that's what's known as bright beer or without yeast. It then goes from there into the finishing tank where it awaits packaging. Most of what I call the industrial brewers use some kind of adjunct. That is, they, in addition to malt, they, also, they use other things. Budweiser, for example, has about 40 percent rice in it. So they take the, the expensive malt out and put rice in. That lightens the beer up considerably and also makes the beer less full on your palate. Um, that's one thing. Other companies like Miller use corn to add to their beer. Many breweries also add sugar, because sugar is much cheaper than uh, malt. So in a, there, aren't, there are only a few beers out there, and none of the major beer, breweries make all malt beer. 
That's one big difference. Chemicals are by far the, the biggest difference between uh, our beer and the others. Because any beer that has to sit in the store unrefrigerated for six months needs to have chemicals in it to preserve it. And uh, big breweries do that, we don't. Now, you only make a lager beer. Right. What is the difference between beer, lager, and ale, or is there? Well, there's a lot of confusion about that, and I, I appreciate how the, the confusion that people have about it. it turns out that, that there's, there's one category of beer, um, and then within that, there are two different types of beer. One of them's called lager, and one of them's called ale. Uh, generally speaking, ales are fermented at higher temperatures in open fermenters, and they use top fermenting yeast. Uh, and ours, our lager beer, on the other hand, is done in closed tanks with a very special kind of yeast um, and at very low temperatures. You can make um, ale beer in about eight weeks, uh, or eight weeks, eight, eight days. Um, and it's often made in a couple of weeks, but you can make it in eight days. It takes us six weeks to make lager beer. And that can be shortened to about five weeks, but that's the limit. Um, and uh, so it takes much longer to make lagers. And I actually, had I been a really smart businessman, I would have had a, uh, an ale brewery because I would have only needed half the fermentation tanks uh, and I could have saved a great deal of money. But I'm not in this just as a business. I'm in it as a matter of love because I wanted to make beer that I'd be proud of and that I really liked. And I think our Dominion Lager is about the best beer I've ever had. Well, let's talk about the business just for a moment. How how far do you wish to expand with this without sacrificing quality? Mm, not very far. I mean, I, I want to only be a local brewery. I have no intentions of making beer to send to New York or Pennsylvania or down south. I just want to make beer that could be sold around here. And I see uh, us going back to the old days where beer was delivered in about a 35 or 40 mile radi radius around the, the brewery. So that means we'll be selling beer in Montgomery County, here in Virginia, and the District of Columbia, but that's about it. When I first started looking at the small brewing industry, there was this sort of feeling that, that there was the, the small brewers against everyone else, essentially against the importers or competing against them. And there really is a, a strong feeling of esprit de corps among small brewers. Um, we generally don't compete against each other. Um, our competition is with people who are sending in expensive beer from outside because I think that our beer competes against those very well on the quality side, and ours is so much fresher. And now, I heard the term microbrewery. Is this a microbrewery? This is a microbrewery, a real one. Okay. Uh, we would have to get about 10 times as big as we are to grow out of the category of microbrewery. What so is we're well within the microbrewery. What does that mean? What is the definition? It just means small. Uh, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's too easy, yes. <laughs> You've given me too much beer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is just a real beautiful six-pack in case. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, the design, how you came about that? Well, it, took a, it was a long process, but uh, we, we decided on some concepts that we wanted. We wanted something that looked natural, something that was clearly identifiable as, as being Virginian. And uh, so we selected the state animal, which is a white-tailed deer. And, uh, but most of the design work was done by Eric Barrett who did a, just a super job, I think. We gave him a lot of advice and counsel, but it's basically his design. And tell me about this, um, it says on the front here, the gold sticker, best draft beer. Yeah, at the Taste of the Town in last August in uh, Washington, D.C., we won the best draft beer award. But, uh, and that was a real honor because we just gotten started. But in November, we also won a bronze medal at the Great American Beer Festival in Denver. That's the, the first, that's uh, the only national contest in the United States where the beers are judged in a blind way by professional judges. And uh, we didn't go, but I got several phone calls from people saying, hey, did you hear, did you hear? And uh, it was really, we were really excited about it. Uh, we were the only brewery from around here to win a medal at the Great American Beer Festival.
Well, I'm not usually a beer drinker, but this is awful fine lager. I want to thank Jerry Bailey, Scott and Ron here at Old Dominion Brewery for letting us take a tour today. Right now we're going to head a little further west in Loudoun County to Willowcroft Vineyards to see how wine is made. I'll see you over there. Ah, uh, you'll sit back and drink some of it. Hey, what are you doing? Don't close it. Get me out of here. Now I know the special ingredient in your brew. Hey, how Hi. you doing, everybody? Hi. <laughs> With Donna Mike, watch what you do. On uh, what station? Ten. I'm wearing a genital cuff. <laughs> Donna's on the genital cuff. You want to find out all about it? Watch what you do. Nick Berry, and today I'm here with Lou Parker at Willowcroft Vineyards, right outside Leesburg, Virginia, in Mount Gilead. Lou, thanks for coming to the show today. Thanks for coming out, Nick. Yeah, thanks for letting us bring our cameras. Today we're going to learn how wine is made. Lou has uh, been generous enough to start me out with a, a little bit of wine. What type of wine is this? This is our Merlot, Nick, and um, I guess maybe I ought to tell you how to how a winemaker would taste wine. Right. Well, idea. you know, most people start in by just uh, taking a sip, but really a winemaker will always, first of all, hold the glass by the stem or by the base. And then he first he looks at the wine to see if it's clear. So you can look down and see if it's clear. And then he'll swirl it in his glass to get the aromas up. And then he puts his nose way down inside there. I don't have any trouble with this because I've got a nice big nose. <laughs> <laughs> now, these are things my mom told me never to do. Oh, this is always done. Even in the most polite restaurants, oh, okay. you can stick your nose way down inside the glass and take a big smell to see what the nose is like. It smells good. Two or three times. And then only after you've done that, you get it to take a sip. Oh, now we can sip. OK. All right. You want to roll that around in your mouth and get it on the back of your tongue and so you keep like that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're tasting 50 or 60 wines, as we sometimes do at a big uh, wine competition, right. why well, you would probably spit it out. But uh, here yeah. today with my Merlot, you don't dare do that. What type of wine is this? It's a Merlot. It's a Merlot. Yeah. And what are the other styles of wine that you do make? Well, we make um, we make um, we grow four types of grapes in our vineyards. We grow Cabernet Sauvignon, which is the red wine grape of the Bordeaux area of France. We grow Chardonnay, which is our principal cultivar, and that's the white wine grape of the Burgundy area of France. We grow Saval, which is a French-American hybrid wine, and we grow Riesling. And this year, we've just planted Cabernet Franc, haven't we, Dave? Cabernet Franc. Sounds so we good. Have well, we're inside the barn right now, which is the lower level of a barn uh, that I guess you renovated yourself. Yes, for this purpose. Okay, and tell me a little bit about the history of uh, Willowcroft. Well, um, the history of Willowcroft Farm Vineyards goes back to when Cindy, my wife, and I and my daughters planted the first vines in 1981. 1980, actually. The first vines all died. We planted the first no. vines in 80, and uh, we didn't know very much about it. And then um, 1981, we planted the, some more. And uh, within three or four years, we had about 4,000 vines under cultivation. And in 1984, we began making wine commercially. You're standing in the wine cellar. This was, before this, was used for animals. And we dug out the floor and put the concrete floor down and brought in the stainless steel that you see here. Lots and, of renovation. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And you have a low ceiling here. Is that a problem? Yes, it is a problem. It's uh, most, if you go into a lot of wineries, you see the wine tanks go way up high. And of course, right. we have to do ours with uh, lower, lower so overheads. Like you actually have dollies here? Yes, uh, for lifting the, the tank's lids off. You know, a good thing with wine is steaks, and I brought the steaks. <laughs> All right, thanks, Nick. What are these actually? <laughs> <laughs> well, these are the pins that close and open the door on our press. This is our, uh, 
This is our Vaslin uh, horizontal press, and this is the heart stone of the winemaking process because this is the piece of equipment that actually separates the uh, grape berries from their juice. And um, it's used earlier in the white winemaking process and later in the red winemaking process. And I'll explain that in just a second. You recall I told you that we bring the grapes in from the field in the morning and then we run them through a piece of equipment which separates the berries from their stems. Now at that point, if we're making white wine, the berries drop into this press from the top and we turn the press on and it's got a big screw down the center and a plate and it actually brings a tremendous amount of pressure against the fruit and the juice drops out into a sump which is below the press and then it's pumped by hand into the stainless steel tanks. Now if we're making red wine, the process is different because red wine is only red because it's fermented in contact with its skins. So in that case, instead of coming from the, from the piece of equipment which separates the, uh, the stems from the berries into the press, we go directly to the fermentation tank. Okay. The fermentation is, inoc is inoculated with the skins in place and then it takes place in the, and the, uh, it extracts the red. And then they go back to the press where they're pressed off and taken to barrels. So the point at which you use the press depends on whether you're making red wine or white. One of the things we use quite a bit of here at Willowcroft, Nick, is uh, stainless steel. You see a lot of stainless steel around our winery. If you went into a winery in Europe, for example, you probably wouldn't see so much stainless steel. They use mostly uh, wooden uh, tanks for fermentation and storage. We like stainless steel. It's clean and it gives us two things that uh, we don't get with wood. One of them is very good temperature control and the other one is extreme cleanliness. We can control our microbial uh, environment much better with wood. Here at Willowcroft we uh, uniquely use what we call variable volume stainless steel tanks. This is one of them and you'll notice that in this tank the lid actually floats on the wine surface. Um, this gives us absolute control over the exposure of the wine surface to air. Uh, when the wine's fermenting, it needs air and the lids are suspended up high and the yeast is going and there's lots of, uh, of oxygen around. But once the fermentation is finished, then uh, oxygen is the enemy of wine and the enemy of the winemaker. So we will drop the lids then right down on the wine surface and seal them off and there's absolutely no risk that uh, we'll have oxygen damage for our wine. These are old kegs. So there's wine actually in here, right? Yes. Uh, even though our fermentation process uh, next starts in the stainless steel, as I described to you, uh, for most of our wines, the wines end up being in barrels. Uh, it's not only tradition, but it also has uh, a very important role in imparting certain flavors to the wine, uh, particularly our Chardonnay, uh, which actually finishes its fermentation in the wine, and all of our red wines, which you'll see a year in the oak before they're bottled and then another year in the bottles before they're released. So what's in here? Well this is uh, Cabernet Franc and um, we can, uh, part of a winemaker's pleasure and duty is to taste wine so why don't you and I have a little try at the Cabernet Franc. Okay, I got the glasses. All right, here we go. Cabernet Franc is the traditional red wine grape of the Loire Valley in France. Uh, these grapes uh, were grown in uh, on a local vineyard, and uh, they're not our grapes, but we have some Cabernet Franc for uh, for next year's harvest. And remember what I told you about tasting, huh? That's right. Swish it around a little yeah, bit. That's right. Stick your snout in there. That's it. <sighs> this is a good uh, Cabernet Franc. It's a very traditional in style, a little bit lighter in body than the Cabernet Sauvignon, and and uh, very refreshing. Huh? How long has this one been in there? Well, this, this wine was uh, pressed in late September and uh, it's been in the oak uh, since, since October. We have, uh, we use a lot of chemistry uh, in our winemaking process. In the United States today, the technology of chemistry is very important to winemaking. Um, the traditional methods of just uh, traditional smell and taste are, are adequate so long as everything works right. But when, uh, when something gets into a difficulty or needs some information, there's no substitute for technology. The uh, 
chemistry you see going on behind me here is an alcohol distillation. Um, we're distilling wine over into a purified form over here so that we can uh, test the alcohol level of the wine. Uh, federal regulations on wine labeling require that the alcohol content that you see on a bottle of wine be within one and a half percentage points of accurate. So we test our alcohol as a regular part of trying to make sure that our labels are correct and of course that our wine's properly made. Well, Lou, you got a bottle here. Is that what this is? Yes, uh, this is a very typical small wineries bottling apparatus. Um, Nick, we, uh, of course, you, as you might imagine, they don't use this at, uh, at Gallo. <laughs> but uh, it's a four spout bottle filler and the way the bottling process works is very simple. We, uh, it takes four of us to bottle, one to clean bottles, one to fill bottles using this apparatus, one to cork bottles, uh, and then one person to move the cases around. And four of us can do about uh, 2,000 bottles in a day if we don't drink too much of it during the process. <laughs> the, um, the way the bottling works is the wine, once it's clarified and detartrated, runs through a sterile filter which filters out any remaining uh, yeast that might be in there or microbes and then it goes into this apparatus and a person can fill four bottles at a time here by just placing the bottles on the rack and then the bottles will fill at their own rate so we have someone over here passing bottles, someone filling and then there's a person over uh, to the right that's, uh, that's corking. The apparatus has an internal mechanism, a float valve, which, uh, which enables uh, the wine to seek its own level so that the wine will actually float at exactly the level that you want it to be in the bottle. And uh, you don't have to worry about your fill levels. And it works very well. It's Is there a general rule as to whites and reds? And the well, there are general rules, but they're made to be broken. Oh, okay. Uh, you should be drinking the type of wine that you like to drink with the food you like to, to try them with. Generally, of course, the red wines, particularly our claret, which is made from Cabernet Sauvignon, goes very well with uh, wild game. It goes wonderfully with the deer that eat it. Uh, <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, very good with uh, hamburgers and roast beef, things like that. But we also like it with chocolate. I notice you have a plate yeah, of chocolate sure over here. Well, we'll a lot of people that. have a lot of people have uh, learned to drink Cabernet-based uh, grapes with chocolate, and they go very well. Okay. Uh, the white wines, the Chardonnay is the most versatile of the wines, and goes with a broad variety of dishes, uh, chickens, and different types of, uh, of fowl. Uh, we have our save all, which we particularly like with seafood. Very good with uh, crab cakes and oysters. It holds its own in flavor with those wonderful Chesapeake Bay bluefish that have that dark stripe of meat down the center of them. Mm. And our Riesling, of course, is the wine that we like to recommend with fruit and dessert and those sort of things. Well, I've had a great time on this episode of What Do You Do? My thanks go out to Jerry Bailey and Lou Parker. I hope you join us next month on What Do You Do?